I've been tapped it a few times now to trim it off. No, I, 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 I agree with you. I think, I think it's nice the yeah. way it is. And you can uh, see the, the colours. It's natural. How do you actually hand on the cure? What, what, what do you do? You do or say something? Or yeah, I have three prayers to say, but I can't tell anybody them prayers. So you have to keep that a secret. If I would tell that, the cure would work. But you're kind of on the side of the deer when it comes very to the fight so. between him and the deer. Absolutely, <laughs> the deer, the deer are very welcome. In fact, there was a joke at that time that. Uh, uh, Donegal turf, uh, put out the fires and <laughs> Damp turf from Donegal. Damp turf, yeah. This is the sorriest thing I've ever done in my entire life. <laughs> if you were to arrive here out of the blue and ask a native the name of the place, the chances are they would not only tell you the name, they would tell you a story as well. It's an ancient and tragic tale concerning a young heroine who lost her life in the waters below me, but in doing so gave her name to the place thereafter. They tend to tell that story a lot here because otherwise the name might seem oddly inappropriate. Welcome to Fintown on the shores of Loch Finn in the highlands of Donegal. The name in question is Fingal, which means fair-haired, and from it we get the name Loch Finn. Three and a half miles of what appears to be at times the darkest water imaginable, certainly not what you'd call fair, hence the necessity for the story. Fingal was the daughter of Lehen, once the owner of all the land hereabouts. He also had a son called Anfar Goan, who had the misfortune to fall in with Finn McCool and the rest of the Fianna in one of their most capricious moods. Cutting quite a long story shortish, Anfar Goan had a trick played on him by Finn, and ended up in a life and death struggle with a wild boar whose litter he had earlier killed. And Fargoan released three hounds, but each in turn was killed by the boar, and each in turn gave its name to the townland in which it perished. And Fargoan and the wild boar finally came face to tusk with each other, and flung themselves into a furious battle that raged up and down the countryside. The boar was more than a match for Fargoan, whose cries for help were eventually heard by his sister Fignal, who is really the heroine of this tale. She had three attributes for which she was greatly admired. She was brave, she was loyal, and she had beautiful blonde hair which grew down to her feet. On hearing her brother's cries for help, she tied up her hair, grabbed a sword, according to some accounts, dived into the water and swam over to the far shore of the lake. But the lake had a confusing echo, and her brother's cries now seemed to come from the shore she had left behind her. Backwards and forwards she swam, trying to follow the sound, until her hair came undone, tangled in her legs and dragged her under the water. Thus, the very things for which she was most admired, her bravery, her loyalty and her beautiful blonde hair, were her undoing. Meanwhile, and Fargoan and the Black Boar continued their fight so fiercely that between them they dug a huge big hole in the ground. Eventually, they killed each other and the hole that they had made filled up with water to be known thereafter as Loch Muck. Thus, we have two locks named out of the one story. Loch Muck, the lake of the pig, nestles in the mountains above Loch Finn and above Fintown, running the length of the loch in the parish of Inniskeel between the towns of Letterkenny and Glenties. The population of Fintown lives on the northern shore, for the most part having to raise their eyes to see the winter sun above Screymoor, Screybeg and Akla, the looming mountains whose shadowy presence plunges the waters of Loch Finn into such darkness. The beautiful Irish word for the echo that so misled the gallant Vignal is Macalla, and that is the name that Seamus McElwee has chosen for the home that he has built overlooking the loch. Unlike Vignal, Seamus will not be found having a dip in these waters, methinks. It's a very cold lake. It's a very cold lake, yes. It's very cold here today, uh, sure. And, and uh, there's an unusual uh, fish in there called uh, char. Yes. Dwarf, dwarf char. Dwarf char? Yeah, which is right. very, very uh, rare in Ireland, we believe. This is where you would actually find it. It is, of uh, course. Yeah. You, you yourself grew up about three miles down the road. On that's the right, right, yeah, Same that's right, Joe, and, yeah. And when you worked away in other places and so on. Yeah, I started in Westmead and, and then uh, I was a teacher there and, and I married there and came back, we came back down to Clonmany yeah. in uh, 82, 83. Right. And we spent about five years in, in, in Inishown. And I moved then to Remelton, and then I moved to Priestla, and uh, 
finally came back to settle in the banks of Lafin here. Right. So this was this a wee, a wee uh, call of the of the home place. Yeah, you maybe think that was it? maybe just like the salmon, come back to where you were, <laughs> to where you were, to where you were come born. Come back, come back. Well, you really spawned at that stage. Exactly. Anyway, but, but yeah. You, but exactly. You came, back, yeah. you came back anyway. Yeah, but I'm delighted to be back here in my in my own land here. Are there many differences uh, nowadays from when you grew up here? Which is, let's you know, it's not that long ago, but it, yeah. you know, it, in, in terms of how things have changed in life generally, I'm sure an awful lot has around here as well. Ah, oh, there would be, of course, the place I suppose has modernised quite a bit. You know, we mm. have more facilities here, you know, and we're still building on those facilities. And I suppose at that time, those the immigration was a big thing here. Pop I was going to say, population has changed. It, it has changed. Yeah, the, the the area here now, it's 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 uh, it's coming back slowly. But there was terrible immigration here. We say in the 50s and 60s, mm. you know, in 70s. Yeah. Whole mm. families just uh, packed packed up in a way. Nothing to keep them here? No Nothing to keep no, no, no jobs, no jobs whatsoever. And even in the towns, I suppose, you had very few jobs. Mm. People here would depend on, on jobs, you see, in the towns, you know. Mm. We, have, we have a few bits and pieces here in, in this mm. area, you know, but not yeah. that much, you know. Tourism, I suppose, to an extent, but back in those days, there was no such thing. There was really. no tourism, no. And even tourism here, yet, uh, we, we don't have the infrastructure, really. You know, we don't, we don't have the B&Bs, or, you know, if, yeah. you, if you had a yeah. small hotel here, it would be a very big help to the yeah. area, yeah. we feel, yeah. But it is, it is strange, it's such a beautiful area. Beautiful, beautiful area. In help. terms of the number of people, though, I mean, are there fewer people living here now than when you were, you were growing up? Oh, there would be, yeah. Far there fewer? Be, there would be far fewer, yeah. I'd say at the moment, in this, in this part, uh, we, we're part of the, of the Enniskeel Parish here, and I'd say that um, in this part now, so you're roughly maybe 500 people or so, you know. Uh, whereas we say maybe back in, in, in the 50s and 60s, you may, you know, double that maybe, maybe even treble that, really? you know. Really? Yeah. I'm just going by the number of schools you had here at the time, you know. Yes. They're all closed and, and just, you have one school here now in Fenton, there's about 65 pupils in it. And when you grew up here too, I mean, this is a gale tact area still, would, would you have grown up with Irish being your first language? Oh, sure, yeah, Absolutely. of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah we, had to learn, we had to learn English, yeah, when we went to the national school, yeah. And uh, uh, we went. I went into College Shane in Galway, which was all Irish secondary school. I see. Then went to Pat's, which was all Irish. So you know, yeah, my yeah. English wouldn't be great. <laughs> Your English isn't bad now, I have to say. <laughs> but but would you still most naturally speak in Irish if you were if you were among your 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 own people? It so depends well. who I'm talking to. You know, at yeah. times, Joe. So you adjust your language according to who you're speaking to exactly. and what your expectations exactly, are. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Seamus would spend a good deal of his time talking in his native tongue and thinking because he spends a good deal of his time meeting and talking with his neighbours. But not just talking. Out of necessity, I suppose, they're great believers in self-help in Fintown, and the fruits of their labours are here to be seen. The most visible, most popular and successful man-made addition to the local Fintown attractions is Anwok Gu, the black pig. Yes, it's that black pig again the one that's been digging up dikes all over Ulster and appearing in the mysterious prophecies of Colin Kill. When the black pig, he's reported to have said, runs through the mountains of Donegal again, peace will return to the land. When the original railway opened here in 1895, people likened the engine to a black pig and declared another prophecy fulfilled. It was fitting then that when local people, as a tourism project, re-established three miles of the railway along Loch Finn, which they did exactly a hundred years later, they named it Anwok Goo, the Black Pig. My fellow passengers, Oliver McDevitt on the right here, and Joe Brennan in the middle, know exactly what a struggle such a labour of love can often be. This track here closed in the 1940s, 47, 48, right. and it was dismantled in the early 50s. Just taken away altogether? Taken away altogether, right. and the land reverted back to the landowners. Right. So therefore, when we went to the side to reopen, we had to re negotiate with the landowners, they didn't permission to run the track again. So when you come back at that stage, Joe, uh, what was here? I mean, was the track all gone at that stage? The track nothing? was all gone, as in the rail and the sleepers and even the, the embankment in places, or, or the, the gravel formation. Could I you mean, still see where the track was? You could absolutely been? see where the embankment was. It was still, the formation was still there. The, the, the rise of the embankment was still very, very visible. But of course, the embankment was totally and absolutely overgrown with bramble and rushes and one bushes and heather and well, na nature, all the nature, nature took back. Over. Nature took it over. The rebuilding of the line was done behind. In fact, when we proposed the idea, first of all, uh, the notion of doing it, because we had no money as a community group, so we thought we'd employ a community development scheme, a fast scheme, take men and far local farmers in part time uh, off, off the dole and away from the, the farming work to give them a wee income for 20 hours a week or a week on, week off. Yeah, yeah. And we put them at cleaning the overgrowth off the line 
and uh, six men. We were turned down the first time because it seemed to be such a ludicrous idea, but we persevered and we applied again the following year and we got our six men on a fast scheme and people actually probably thought it was a joke because we sent six men out uh, very famously with an order to the local co-op uh, for six shovels, six spades, six pickaxes and four wheelbarrows and we told them you have three miles of track to clear of one bushes and heather and rushes and people thought it was just absolute ludicrous. But it be happened because they, they it. Because what? They thought the task was too big? They thought the task was too big. They thought it would be like any major engineering work that you would need a contractor, you'd need D4 dozers and JCBs and all sorts of gadgets really like that. They, all, we, they underestimated the skill and the strength of Donegal farmers, obviously. They kind of did, especially yeah. the local Fintown farmer. <laughs> From the Guild of Larry, there's yeah. a strong, there's a different breed of man. There's a, there's a thrandness about them. There's a thrandness <laughs> about them that even when it came to laying rail, they weren't going to succumb to the CIE engineers. They just got a couple of fellas out in Foyle Valley Railway in Derry yeah. and said, listen, how do we lay these bits of rail? And, you know, they came to us in the committee and they said, well, you know, we need more tools. And we says, what do you want? Yeah, yeah. Well, we have track to lay. There's 80 foot length of rail lying there. They're weighing a ton a piece. We need two things. We need more manpower and we need crowbars and sledgehammers. And that's all so they yeah, started yeah. to lay the track with an, inv an enhanced inventory of tools. It has to be one of the most beautiful railway tracks ever laid down anywhere, and certainly in this country well, anyway. I mean, we can we can look to no less a, a man than Brian Freel, uh, who we invited back in the early days to become our honorary president because of his association with the area and with Glenties and mother being from there. And travelling on the railway as a young boy from from Derry to spend a summer school holidays in Glenties and travelling on, as he called it, the rail bus, which we're on now today. And Freel wrote in those early days before there was ever a sod, he turned the sod to clean the line and he wrote in a foreword for our first members magazine that what was on offer was potentially a journey along a, a lakeside as grand as any in Switzerland or Minnesota. And uh, I thought when Brian Field said that, well, you know, I've been to Switzerland and I've been to Minnesota, and you're right, Brian, and it's good enough it for you to say it. Uh, you know, that's, that's it. So a lot of people that have come down the years, yes, have marveled on the location and how beautiful it is and that. My next morning in Fintown dawned deep and crisp and uneven. It's the frost and the boggy terrain I'm referring to that had overnight crystallised into a kind of winter wonderland. I had arranged to meet Thomas Gilday, who promised a tough enough trek over mountainy bogland and streams to get to our destination. In the event, the icy glaze on the sphagnum and on the rushes actually gave us a bit of support, even putting here and there a bit of a spring in our step. Well, almost. Among other skills and aptitudes, Thomas lists a short but effective stint as an independent TD for the area. But our attention today is to be focused on a particular interest of his. The architectural legacy left behind by the original Mach Du, as exemplified by the railway bridge straddling a river of many names running between Fintown and Glanties. It would be more of a viaduct than a bridge, you yeah. see. That's why it's so high but uh, the quality of the workmanship is exceptional because the stonemasons who built it were very, very skillful people. Yeah. And as you can see, the arch is perfect. And it was some feat in those days, in the 1890s, to get yeah. that type of a finish on, on bridges. 18, uh, 1895, as I remember, that the actual the line opened, isn't, yeah, that, the isn't line, that right? the line opened in 1895. So, that, so, so they'd have been building that like for the year before that, oh would yeah, that have been an idea? <coughs> for a year or two before that right. would be the time it would be built, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, all that stone was quarried locally. Uh, it's all granite, and it was quarried locally in a nearby quarry. And it was all pre-mechanisation, that was all oh, just yeah. done by hand, all, all of it? All done by hand, right, yeah. Right. And those days, the people working on the line, on the laying of the line, they were paid uh, the sum of ten and sixpence in the old uh, money. Ten and sixpence for, for... For a week. For a week's, yes. wa a week's wages? Yes. It probably was quite good wages oh, it back was, then. it days. was quite good, yeah. but the, the fellows working in the quarry, 
they got uh, an extra half crown, two and six, yeah. so they got 13 shillings. Right, yeah. right, because of yeah. they were skilled workers? Yeah, and were, yeah. Were, were, were quarry workers brought into the area for that purpose, or were these local people? Oh, they were all local. All local men? All local men. Right. Now. So skilled yeah. masons, in other words? Skilled stone yeah. masons. I with the, so, you know, stone masonry was uh, quite common in the area at the time, yes. so there were very skilled stone masons in the area. I see. In fact, there's a story about one bridge, not that one, where they were having great difficulty in closing the arch properly. Right. And the story goes that there was a, a travelling tailor in the area who said that uh, he heard they had difficulty and he said that if he uh, got a glass of whiskey, he would close the arch for them. And his uh, services were asked for right. and he did. And you, you don't know how he did this, in other I words, no? I don't know, but that's right. how the story and goes. That's it. And that was his pay, a glass of whiskey? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, he came, he came relatively cheap. He did. But uh, it's really stood the test of time, so it's, it's well over 100 years old oh, now. Oh, yeah, it is. And I'm sure, apart from the fact that you get the odd wee bit of growth of moss and so on, it looks as good as it was probably on the day that because it was Because we yeah. had those bridges looked at yeah. uh, back about 10 years ago by a retired... CIE engineer right. whose job uh, whose job uh, uh, was uh, checking bridges for CIE, yeah. and he came to the conclusion that the br these bridges, all bridges and culverts along this line, were all in as good a quality as the day they were built. Yeah. yeah. yeah so that could a, still support the weight of a yeah, train. Yeah, it could. Yeah. Mm. But it, it's, I mean, it must have made such a difference to life in this area whenever you had a train service coming in and out. Because this is days when you didn't have great roads. Oh, that's right. What mm. made an amazing? It was an amazing facility mm. for the area because yeah. it opened up the whole area for a certain amount of commerce as yeah. well. Because. Uh, 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 one of the industries that sort of uh, you know sprang from it was mm. the cutting and uh, saving of turf, which of were course. then uh, yeah. sent away by rail, yeah. Yeah, yeah, to areas of population. Some of it going as far as Dublin, in fact. Well, I'd heard before that, especially during the war years, when the, when, when when coal was scarce, yeah. an awful lot of Donegal turf was was taken down by train to Dublin. Oh yeah, it and was. And there was a, there, the fact that there was a turf mountain in Phoenix Park. Yeah, settled. that's right. right. In yeah. fact, there was a joke at that time that uh, uh, Donegal turf. Uh, put out the fires and <laughs> damp turf. Damp go turf, yeah. 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 Well, they grew they grew a damp up here, all right. Yeah. <laughs> it's easy to imagine it, isn't it? And Wachgu, the railway, being extended along this line, which has been kept in deep freeze, to continue its journey from Loch Finn through what is still very much unspoiled Donegal wilderness. This time, you would hope, bringing people into the area rather than shipping out vast tracts of the county to be burnt or otherwise used in the homes of Dublin and elsewhere. You'll remember this monument in the icy windswept heights around Loch Muck, depicting in stone the legend of the wild boar and the three hounds of Infargo and that he killed. It's evidence that the tradition of stone masonry, stone artistry really, mentioned by Thomas Gilday at the railway bridge, is still alive in Fintown. It's relatively easy to track down the local mason responsible for this work because he's left us his trademark, his signature, if you like, of the stag's head. Meet Michael McDevitt, master of the craft. Um, how would you describe yourself? I mean, you, you, you do the monumental masonry and, uh, you know, the headstone yeah. and so on. Yeah. So, uh, but then, I mean, I would, uh, looking around the other stuff you do, you're a stone carver, you know, uh, uh, a, be a, sculpt too, uh, a sculptor. Uh, well, not a sculptor, I wouldn't no. say a sculptor, I would say just a, a traditional craftsman, a mm. traditional stone cutter, as mm. they used to call them years ago. Would stone cutters have had, had the kind of artistic skills that you would you have? Oh, they would, yeah. Seriously? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, and doing figures and all those kinds of things, would that be part of, a, part of the craft? It's all part of the craft, from building your first stone, Joe, to actually carving a bit Aye. on an old rock. I, mean, I don't mean a fancy piece of stone that you would get. Yes. And by somewhere, uh, maybe getting a rock out in the field and giving it a fairly smooth face and uh, something so, simple, you know, right. something that's lying around there. I mean, you have a beautiful piece of sandstone there. Yep. In the middle of it, you have emerging out of it. Uh, this, you, you've chiselled this wee man, and he, in turn, is actually chiselling another stone, that's which, right. which is a nice, right, uh, a nice wee uh, touch, you know? Yeah. So, uh, that's lovely. It really is. So, what, 
a stone carver, you would be happy enough to be described as one of the skills of a mason to carve stone. Would that be fair enough? That'll be true, Joe, yeah. 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 That's good. Yeah. Well, what, how did you get into it in the first place yourself? Well, I was into the wood carving years ago, and uh, there's no fortune to be made at wood carving, although it was a great pastime and very enjoyable. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I've done quite a few heavy duty masonry jobs for the Department of Marine, and, and I've worked in a few piers and bridges and stuff like that. Right. Right. Worked right up, and, and that, was, yeah. that was building masonry work, like, you know. Oh, I see, right, uh, right, right, right. And uh, worked right up, and, and, and I was fed up with the traveling anyway, so. Yeah. Uh, I graduated, uh, I thought, well, I'll give the stone curve and I go, and, and there it just happened, mm. more or less, just like that. It was, it was just, it, it's, it's the same as the timber curve, and yeah. the chisels is a bit different, but it's the same technique you use. So you kind of less. taught yourself more than anything else, did you, really? Taught, Self-taught, Joe, yeah. Right, right. yeah. Is, yeah. It was right. a chance, but yeah. I kept battering away and managed the mistake I made, but it, it turned out so You, you learn from your mistakes quicker than you learn from your successes, That's right. don't you? That's right. But you obviously had to have some kind of bent for this in the first place. You must have had the hands, in other words. I was always yeah. fond of art, yeah. Joe, yeah. and yeah. You must, artistic you must, things. You were always, even as a youngster, like good at drawing and all those kinds of things that, the, that I suppose you apply to this here. Yeah, you know? yeah. yeah. yeah more or less. So you, well. see, you see this surface here, Michael, before you go on any further? See that lovely, uh, smooth surface there? Yeah. Did you create that surface as well, did you, from the stone? Yeah, it did, yeah. It was created just with an angle grinder, Joe, and then sandpaper. You know, to give it a fairly smooth surface to See, work that's, on. See, that's, that's the thing I can never, I never fully understand how you, how that can be done. Yeah, it's not exactly flat now. If you, no, if but if it's a lovely, I mean, I can feel it and there's no yeah. roughness about it at all. No, it is a lovely no. smooth surface. But at the surface. same time, it's nice to show the roughness here around the edges, you know. I created a wee bar there, and it's lovely to see the, that it is actually stone. You like that, and that's why you left, you left your yeah, stone, your carving. I've been the tempted. The stone around yeah. it. Yeah, I've been tapped it a few times now to trim it off. No, I, 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 I agree with you. I think, I think it's nice the yeah, way it is. And yeah. you can see the it's corners. Natural. It's natural. Yeah. And, and there's something about it, you said earlier, the way it's emerging from the stone. You know, the, 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 That's the, right. You know what I mean? Right. Maybe it was always there to come out anyway, Joe, and, and I just oh. happened to be the lucky man that found it. <laughs> well, Michelangelo's, Michelangelo's theory, wasn't it, that the, every statue that he carved was inside that big lump of marble? Exactly. And all he was doing was chipping away all the stuff he didn't really yeah. need, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I can chip away plenty of stuff you don't need in this one. <laughs> I would suspect that it would be very heavy-handed indeed with it, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. So what, what, um, what would well, you, how, how, how would you go about it? There followed what I now regard as the almost obligatory session of reinforcing for me the gulf that exists between the craftsman and the passerby, especially this passerby. The modest and extremely patient Michael allowing me first to gouge a trench out of sandstone that the black pig would have been proud of, before, rather recklessly I thought, allowing me to skate alarmingly across an expensive piece of polished granite. I think, in all honesty, Michael's young daughter Eilish, who seems to have inherited some of her father's talent, as well as a fondness for this kind of work, would make a much better fist of it. Michael McDevitt reminds me of another mason I once met near the shores of Loch Melvin. John Byrne very kindly presented me with a monument. Michael McDevitt did the same. Eventually, it'll represent a very good friend of the family. Kindly souls, these masons. Lesser Spotted Ulster, proudly sponsored by Glens of Antrim Potatoes. Lesser Spotted Ulster, proudly sponsored by Glens of Antrim Potatoes. John O'Donovan, in the course of his journey and on behalf of the Ordnance Survey back in the 1830s, when he was collecting the townland names of Ireland, spent some time in Fintown. Now, there was most likely not an awful lot for O'Donovan to do most nights on his travels, except perhaps fall in with bad company. He was, thankfully, a most prolific letter writer, and he's left us some very colourful descriptions of the places that he's visited. And on Sunday night, the 12th of October, 1835, he wrote a letter from Pintown as follows. A thousand mountain streams, brooks, runnels, rills and streamlets, tinged with the colour of their native mountains, hasten down, some slowly and silently, others hoarsely and precipitately, to offer tribute to the queenly Finn. The queenly Finn, which shines black from the point where she escapes from her parent lock, to that point where, mingling with her sister Morn, she loses her name and her waters in Loch Foyle. In truth, not a lot has changed here since 1835. Mm. 
It is a never-ending source of wonder to me to think of these streams and rivers tumbling unceasingly down these mountains, not only for hundreds, but for thousands of years. O'Donovan undoubtedly stood on this very spot on this riverbank. In his day, of course, there would have been no tarmac roads, no railway. A beaten track would most likely be the best to get hope for throughout most of his travels. It wouldn't be very wise either to wander too far off that beaten track, certainly not at this time of year, when you'd be unlikely to survive an overnight lost in the mountains. Back in the 1830s, I suspect, lost travellers were left to their own devices, so travellers in general had to be more careful. I'm not saying we can abandon all common sense these days, but if you do have the misfortune to fall down something or get lost in your stylish but utterly inadequate clothing, then help is at hand in the form of the Donegal Mountain Rescue Team. It's bitterly cold, we have a tough trek to our destination, and even though I'm wearing layers of thermal stuff, I'm shivering with the thought that Brendan and Joe and the rest of the team are threatening to tie a rope around me and throw me off a cliff backwards. I am playing along with them in the hope that a proper rescue team will come along and rescue me before that happens. If you get up there and the clouds come down, the mist comes down, it could be disorientating, I would imagine. Mm. Absolutely. In, 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 in the mist, um, you might not know whether you're going downhill or coming uphill. People don't Seriously? believe that. That is true. The terrain is so, so much the same. If you only see five metres ahead of you, yes. you could actually be going up an incline. Yeah. And you would not know it. Well, in the climb, in a very short distance, we had to climb up here. We, we climbed down as much as we climbed up in the sense yeah. because you're, you're going down and up constantly. Yeah. So yeah. in a mist, that could be very so you, you actually wouldn't know. You wouldn't know up from down. In other words, you wouldn't. Uh, and sometimes, yeah. well, if you if you sit down for a, a wee break or something, yeah. and you get up, you, you do you can lose your yeah. your sense of direction. Sometimes sure, that happens to me at home. For <laughs> goodness sake. So so you could be up here uh, and you don't know where you are. And it's only really when you don't come back at a certain time that people realise... Oh, oh, no, it's it's generally after dark when families or whatever. They we get worried. worried. not back yet. Well, where do you it's start? What do you, what, you know, what's your first thing? You well, we all, we're always preaching the, the tale. If you're going out for a walk, yeah. tell, tell someone tell where somebody, you're going. Right. You know, and stick to that route. Yeah. And uh, so when that doesn't happen, then mm. yeah, we do <clears> have a bit of a problem. Like yeah. if we know you're in... Went to the Blue Stacks for a walk. Right. The Blue Stacks is a big, big place. Big so place, exactly. Like, yeah. if we can find your car, right. that's a good start point because a hiker, you know, there's there's twelve different types of categories of missing people. And, and what? How, how do you mean? Uh, well, um, it's compiled by you know statistics over the years. Like we have, we have hikers, hunters, Alzheimer patients, and all those have they they behave differently. I see. So right. if we if we can say for sure that you are a hiker. Right. And we find your car. We know by previous uh, statistics that you'll be found within three miles, just over three miles right. of your last known location. I see. So that, and again, a missing hiker will have, he'll generally follow trails, uh, streams, forest edges, that kind of thing. Well, that, so that, it helps that, us narrow down the right. search field. You know? They'll do sensible things, in other words. They do. Uh, hikers Ten, generally tend do. Yeah, to. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. But then you're going to get people who haven't a clue when they're up here, in other uh, words, as well. And yeah. they, they're unpredictable, presumably. They are. They need to come up with a pair of jeans and a T-shirt. And maybe <laughs> 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 a banana you're or something. You're all, you're just all 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 all, you, all, you, know, you all have the gear. I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm reasonable. Being, you know, <laughs> really, it's amazing that more people don't get injured, yeah. really, yeah, and lost. Because so many people are ill-prepared, you know, and it's a, I, I just can't believe how few people actually do get into trouble. Right. Mm. So, somebody was saying that you actually have to learn to almost track people, like, you know, like, uh, yeah. like Indian trackers would have done in the past. It's a bit more scientific, though. Almost like that. Like, almost you know, like we'd, that. We'd be, uh, we'd be aware. Like, I of, couldn't uh, track an elephant case. up through that. <laughs> ground. We, we just come through the most, the most you amazing think that, terrain. It's amazing. Uh, it's amazing the. The, the visibility you leave behind crossing the stream or crossing the muddy track. Me personally, you yes, mean? Yes, <laughs> you, you and every other. No, you're dead, right? Uh, yeah, thank you, you'll yeah. always leave yeah. signs of you being in an area. Yes. And maybe for hikers, they'll take, they might follow, follow a forest track and it might be the first thing we might look at. But so, so we, we, we come out on that, right? Even things like the bent grass and, 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 oh, yeah. and things like that. Uh, and uh, footsteps everywhere foot, you go. Footsteps and say going up uh, yeah. steep banks, you, make it wee, you, know, you might yeah. slip and leave yeah. a trail like that behind you, you know. Right. And right. discarded and bits of uh, sweet wrapper or even clothing. Uh, or a glove or anything. Any, anything that... The, the real the, telltale sounds. Yeah. Yeah. But we're going on a wee bit, um, 
a wee bit further. You're all going on a bit further and you're all going to do a bit of ab sealing just to, just to show how it's done. It's not, it's well, not the case are. here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. no I, that, was, that, was only a, that was only a trick to lure you up here. Right? Know, you, we'll see about you're that. going to do the ab sealing. <laughs> all visitors you're not seriously going to throw me over that cliff up there. Uh, we're going to throw you over yeah. this cliff here. We believe that uh, he's a bouncy type of a chap and not... Well, that hasn't, been, that hasn't been tested so far, but I, I, boys, I'm serious, I have no head for heights whatsoever. All right? no, so confusing. as long as you don't mind me doing the whole thing of the eyes closed, you know? I don't know. Right. Right. See, I'm you'll serious. notice how I'm lulling them into a kind of complacency that their fiendish plan to throw me off a cliff just for laughs is still somehow going to work. I don't want to discourage them entirely, however, because they are, of course, volunteers. Remember Joe Brennan from the train carriage? Well, the mountain rescue team is another of Joe's voluntary contributions to the improvement of the quality of life for everybody in the area, including visitors. Whilst we're still making our breathless way further uphill, there's time to visit yet another example of the self-help principle that operates strongly within the Fintown community. Joe's wife, Una Brennan, is showing me how this particular patch of land, a cleared forest area, will be transformed for the use of native and visitor alike by the plantation of broadleaf trees. The hallucinogenic colours on the gate are courtesy of culture. All the forestry gates have been painted bright colours so that you can actually see them. Uh, you know, keep, it saves people from reversing into them or anything I just thought like somebody was in a good mood or something. Like no, that unfortunately not, but they, they did actually have all the gates um, painted like that and it just sort of brightens up. People's actually yeah. aware that they're there. And, you well, know, they're just again, a a nice festive atmosphere as well. Absolutely, and it yeah. also, I suppose, you know, denotes their territory and stuff like that. They, yeah. People would, you know, recognise that they know the culture yeah. and paint the gates that colour. So they're, so they're that. doing that with all their gates? They're right doing that with all of their gates That's at the great. moment, yeah. A lot of the metal ones, like the timber ones, wouldn't. Um, yeah. They wouldn't be painted in those colours. Very good. Well, it's better than dull grey, is it? Yeah, yeah, put it that way. Okay. So, oh. oh, close gates afterwards, of course. That's the last thing I remember. So this area we're just in now at the moment, Anna, is this, uh, this is the, the beginning of the whole project, just where we are now? This is the beginning of the project, yes. We'd hope to start to develop it from the gate in, where they would yeah. actually put 30 metres of car parking um, either side of the gate for to allow people to park on the side of the road to be safer than having to cross. Right. And then they, this will be the main pathway that will go down through it. But um, the path will go off to either side. They will go right round the, the, go right the round split the down here, will you bet? Absolutely, right. yeah. Now, already you've got quite a variety of different well, your furs, conifers and so on up here now at the present time. Yes. But, but, but quite, a, quite a variety even of those that yeah. we have here, yeah? A lot, a lot, there's a lot of um, trees here. This forest was planted in about, I think it was 1982. Right. Um, there's 54 hectares or whatever in it. Right. Um, about 50% of that failed. And, Why um, was that? Now, was because it... the land wouldn't be the best. The, basically, you know, you have blanket bog and yes. you have bedrock and stuff like that there. Right. So you wouldn't have the best of soil for planting the trees in. So it's a challenge for any tree to get a hold here? Do you, do absolutely, you, really, really? absolutely. Right. So we thought because basically after it was cut it looked very much of an eyesore once it was harvested. I can see what you mean up, up on the wee hillside here we have um, lots of, of logs lying and around right, and, yeah. and debris as you would put it from, yeah. from, from the trees that were there before and yeah. one single lone standing lone tree, yeah. tree over the top that, that, was, that wasn't a fir tree no it's probably an ash or a rowan tree or right. something like that there like for the planting of this now we would be looking in this low area and especially along the walkways and that yeah. to plant um, likes of native broadleafs birch and uh, different trees like that there we'll have some oaks in it we'll have some blackthorn right. I was going to say though I mean, if you had difficulty growing you know any trees and for even even yes. conifers which mm -hmm. are which are pretty hardy and would grow anywhere practically speaking yeah how are you going to really grow oaks and things well like that? the oak will be the hardest obviously because oak wouldn't be indigenous to the area really so right. the oak will be the hardest to grow but they reckon that they have tested the soil especially in here around the bottoms of the two the yard moor and the yard bug and they have tested the soil there and they do believe that it will be fit to take and the other place that would have great um time for planting the oak will be along the river bank they believe that like it opens up like a whole new habitat then for the area of fishing because there's about 400 different species of insects well, that actually grow in the oak, uh, you know, and live yes, off the oak yes. tree, <clears throat> and they will then attract a whole set of wildlife and um, different bird, feeding birds and stuff like that into the area. Well, it'd be wonderful because you could transform the whole environment, really, the natural environment. Very much so. You, very much. So it's, it's basically yeah. to try to enhance the, you know, to enhance. I suppose, firstly, the area in itself as a tourist attraction and that. Yeah. And secondly, you know, we have it here. It's very scenic. Mm. Um, you know, you have Scrig and Atla in the background. Mm. We're mm. along 
the um, R250, yeah. which is the main route for people coming from Northern Ireland and East Donegal and to Dunlow, Glenties and Ardra. So we would attra attract a lot of passing tourists yes, yes. and we'd hope that it would just build on the things that we already have here, like the train and uh, the different facilities in the, in the area. It's, uh, is there part of you that wonders, is this, is this really what this area you know, uh, should be like? Because it has its own character. Do you, do yes. you know what I mean? It's got, yes. I mean, here you've got, you know, maybe some people might think this is barren. Yeah. Uh, um, and there's bog land, and there's, you know, there's big, big areas like we have here, old cutaway turf banks and all sorts of things. But, you know, that's, that's kind of Donegal at the same time. It's oh, Donegal Highlands, isn't it? Really? It is, yeah. You know? And it still will remain very much that. Like, you know, no matter what work you do, yeah. you're not going to take the rushes out of it. You're not going to take away the heather and that that we have here, or the wind trees that are there behind us. You know, those yeah. kind of things are going to remain, and it will be very natural. So you're adding to it. You're not taking much, something no, away. No, it's to really enhance it more than anything else. And to make it that you know that it'll be of some use to the people of the area it will be wheelchair accessible it will be buggy friendly yeah. and again it'll be people places where people can take children and let them out so it's, you not, know. it's not just the rugged adventurer type you're talking uh, about no, you're not talking about. attract all types hopefully because yeah. like again you know you're set behind the mountains here yeah. and you have plenty you know plenty of scope for climbers and everything like that indeed how can it fail when you have people of una brennan's energy and commitment behind it but her mention of climbers reminds me. Something I left hanging somewhere, I think. They're called hedgehogs. Hedgehogs? Oh, I can yeah. see why you've got the wee spine sticking out of them. Exactly. Okay. And they're basically anchoring your, your belay rope right. and your safety rope. To the mountain. But they're just they're just hammered into fairly soft ground, aren't they? Yeah. Hammered into fairly soft ground, but they're extremely reliable. I mean so, we have so far. So far. Well Well we've used one of these right. in ground similar to this right. to get a Land Rover out of a ditch. Just one of them? One of them with a winch on the front of the Land Rover. Right. And just one of them was took the whole way to the Land Rover out of the ditch. This wasn't a wee dinky land? No, 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 no. no, no. The one. So we reckon that the four should uh, hold you, <laughs> keep you up. <laughs> The trouble is getting me over the edge. That's the problem, but it'll take a Land Rover to get me over the edge. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, no, uh, persuasion is what's necessary there. No brute force. This cliff that you're on at the present time would be a pretty well-known practice cliff for this kind of a thing, would it? We just found it the other day. <laughs> so you haven't actually used this cliff before? We had we, we right. yesterday. Right. Right. So. <laughs> no, I don't know. Right, OK. They had obviously totally deluded themselves that I was still going to go through with it. But the phrase, no head for heights, doesn't even begin to cover it. I have no toes for heights, no ankles, arms, neck, no body for heights. It would be exaggerating to say that my whole life was flashing in front of me, but it's fair to say that the few days I'd spent in Fintown were coming into sharp and rather nostalgic focus. I was thinking of time spent in the warm and soothing presence of Nora McGill. Nora is said to have the cure for ringworm, passed down through her family. Thankfully, I've not had it, so I don't need to seek treatment. But I can testify to the fact that Nora certainly has the cure for the cold. Nora, tell me about the. Was, was your father had this cure before you had it? Was it? Or, yeah, or he the got, family. He got the cure from a man in her own name, Maguire. He then got hand the cure down to three people. So he cured on then till he was getting old, and he gave me the cure and my brother Jimmy and Pat. I see. So he handed it on to three other people. In yes. Other Is that the idea? Yes. Right. But, but how, that's what I want to know. How do you actually hand on the cure? What, what, what do, you, do you do or say something? Or yeah, what? I have three prayers to say, but I can't tell anybody them prayers. So you have to keep that a secret? If I would tell that, the cure wouldn't work. I see. Yeah. Right. So whenever your father was being given this yes. cure, yeah. he was one of three people yes. that this man McGuire was handing this yes. cure on to. Yeah. Uh, and well, he had to say these prayers, yes. but... Nobody knew it. Nobody only, knew it. Only right. the ones were going to do the cure. I see. And he right. cured on then till he was getting old, and when he was getting old, then we started doing the cure then. When he died, we started doing the cure then. But well, you, you waited until he yes. until, until he passed away yes. before you started yes. doing that. Yes, right, right, right. Was that the agreement, or was that something? Oh no, it was he carried on. We didn't bother. No. And did you have the name for it as well in the area? I mean, did your family have that name for this cure? People knew that you, that the, the cure was in this family. Maybe I did that surely, and I get a lot of people. 
Right. I do. And where and where did they come from? All over. They come from Glens Willie and Glendon and Churchill and some from Red Kenny and all that. Mm. And I had a woman there uh, early in the year from Glen Bay. She had a wee girl with her, and I never oh. seen her since. Is that right? And right. Some of them comes maybe a couple of times, maybe two times, three times, and other people just the two for the first two. I see. Yeah. Is it the case that, that it might work the first time and therefore they don't need to come back the second or third time? Yeah, when it works right, they don't have to come back. Right. But if it doesn't work, but they have to keep up with the rules and you tell them they can't take minerals or oranges or apples or... Oh, so there's a number of things they have yes. to do as well? Yes, yes. Right. And Guinness and Frisky and things like that, they can't take that when so they have the ringworm. You can't take alcohol no, at no, all? No, And fuzzy drinks, you no, say, or something yes. like that, you can't take yeah. those at all? No. Right, right. And then a bat batting themselves in water or anything, that water's very bad for spreads it all over your body. I see. Yeah. So, a mixture of traditional cure, common sense and good hygiene is what Nora is practising. Yes. And it's interesting to note that although she's been doing this for years and although ringworm is a highly contagious fungal infection, Nora herself she says, has never been infected. Meanwhile, there's no cure for fear of heights, and I was still in need of being rescued from the rescue team. Do you want someone else to have another go, or do you want to go now? Or? No, I think, uh, I, I think you should do this in stages, right? right? I think today we do the helmet, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. By this time, word had got out to mountain rescuers the world over that there was good crack to be had up a mountain near Fintown, especially when my head hit yep. the ground. So not only did we have people from Donegal, we had them from England as well, and even Italy. Maria Angela here went to such pains to reassure me that she went over herself. The others looked at me as if to say, see, a slip of a girl did it. It didn't work. <laughs> right. You never seen a hedgehog like that before, but there you go. No. That hedgehog, every time you see a hedgehog for the rest of your life out on the Furry Glens of Ulster. Is that what thinking, hedgehogs look that's, like? That's what the hedgehogs look like. I thought they were wee small things. No, they're not. They're <laughs> round, that's four hedgehogs there well, now. No wonder I haven't recognised uh, the one I've uh, seen them before. The wildlife. I never thought I'd, I'd rely on four hedgehogs uh, to save my life. I'm going uh, on. Four hedgehogs would save your life in the Gilded Lair. <laughs> <laughs> I went away on a safari trip to Namibia two years ago mm. and we were sitting on the bus in Lippers going to the airport and the first bit of wildlife the young fella saw was a hedgehog crossing the... <laughs> Get away. That's the sisters mm. I'm standing here today looking yeah. at these four yeah. hedgehogs. Yeah. It's the first photograph in the album of a safari trip to Namibia, hedgehog and leopards. This is all small talk to keep my mind off what I have to do, isn't that the case, isn't it? Yes, it's kind we're of not good at the past small, graveyards. We're you know? not good at the small talk around here, no, you know. Not too bad. You're a couple of days. <laughs> is that a harness comfortable? It's, um, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's can't, feel any, can't feel the blood going under my legs any longer, but it's <laughs> not fine. It is. It's fairly anyway. snug. Fairly snug. Okay. No, I'm, keeping, I'm talking about hedgehogs and any, any rubbish at all, just to keep my mind off having me think about that. I'll when give you a little tip. Uh, when, you, when you're starting off, yeah. just focus on your feet, right. rather than looking around, because yeah. you know, if you're just walking on the ground, yeah. well, it's the same, really because you're not going to go anywhere else, you're not going to fall. So if you're just focusing on what your feet are doing and not thinking about what's beneath you, you know? Look, look what's just come up the hill. Hey. <laughs> oh, how was yeah, that? Mate. How that was, was that? Grand. Right. No problem. I mean... Well done, well done. It did, I mean, it's not natural. Because it's not natural, it's just been suspended on the cliff. Oh, it's actually yeah. very enjoyable. It is a bit... It's scary. Don't, don't look down. Well, look, look well, well, the last advice I got was look at my feet only. Yeah, don't, just don't look, look at, at your feet. And then in the very last part, you just basically let it go. Yeah. It's perfectly safe. It's, yeah. It's a good crack. It's quite good. It's good crack. <laughs> you know, you often don't know what that means. <laughs> But hang on a minute until we get the safety net. If somebody, you've told, you've told Marianne that good crack means scared witless. Yeah. Like <laughs> Okay, right. Any point in putting off any further? No. You just remember to keep your right hand by your hip. I remember to keep your right hand by your hip. If you pull the trigger too far, put it back around that way again. Back around that way again. Okay. And then slowly bring it back. Again. Okay. All right. This is the sorriest thing I've ever done in my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Remember, I have it here. All right. Okay. I think that's it.
It's a bit jerky. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Just keep your right hand back. Ultimately, I suppose, it's the complete confidence of the team that is so reassuring. In spite of the fear, the terror even, their calm certainty that you cannot fall, that they won't let you fall, finally wins the day. And that's the serious side to this exercise. Someday soon, that calm certainty that they've practiced here will be the difference between somebody dying and somebody staying alive. Too far out. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I suppose the most terrifying part of it is that very first that over the edge of over the edge that, that, that initial mm. trusting things as you said I had to trust all you guys and I mean that was that was a, that was the key to it mm. yeah. you know if you're with people you think you know what they're doing you know yes. so <laughs> all credit to yourselves you know. the descender that that device is rescue rated you know so it's, it's full of safety features and it is awkward to it's use it's almost got too many safety features has, in a sense yeah. because I, it, it, it wouldn't let you be reckless at all yeah. in yeah. other words you, you, you it won't go goes and down but you handled it like a pro exhilarating mm -hmm. I think that was the word for it um, terrifying to be more honest with you. <laughs>